I prepared a paper which is much too long to read uh, and I don't like to read my papers any, in any case. Uh, so I'll talk freely, but I more or less jettisoned what I had prepared because uh, much of what I wanted to say really has been said here and uh, there's very little argument, I feel, about the propo proposition that uh, the Allies could not have rescued the millions but could have rescued thousands. Perhaps I made a mistake. I should have said thousands, even tens of thousands. And they did not do it, refused to do it. So I think uh, in a sort of overall way, we seem to, most of us, I think, uh, agree on that proposition in perhaps different forms. So what I want to start with is something else. I find that there are subtexts in what we are doing. You see, when you deal with uh, American policies in the 1930s, you very often meet the argument that uh, the United States could or should have rescued German Jewry afterwards, Central European Jewry, from the Holocaust, which assumes really, or implies, consciously or not, that people could or should have known that the Holocaust was coming. In other words, that there were people who predicted the Holocaust. I don't agree with that. Now, there were dark forebodings, certainly, uh, for a long time before the Holocaust occurred. You have Uritz Greenberg in Poland in the 1920s, then in Palestine, not dealing with Germany. I mean, nobody thought of Germany as being a source of uh, mass murder. But dark predictions about the future of the Jewish people, obviously influenced by the massive annihilation of tens of thousands of Jews in the Ukraine mainly, in the Russian Civil War between 1918 and 1922, today almost totally forgotten. There was Shai Agnon, who uh, wrote a story also in the 20s about his shtetl, Buchach, which he called Shabush, and where the enemy was on the other side of the river, and he would cross the rib bridge and destroy, kill the Jews. And there were other poets and literary figures like that. And for instance, you find a person like Ilya Ehrenburg, before he became a communist in 1922 in Belgium, writing the story of the extraordinary adventure of Julio Jorenito and his disciples, in which he described the mass murder of the Jews of Europe by burning them at a stake, obviously taking his cue from the Spanish Inquisition, which didn't attack Jews, but conversers, but it's the same thing. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, in 1870, writes that the Jews contributed a great deal to the makeup of the European of the population, but they were endangered by German nationalism, which was going to threaten to destroy them. And 50 years before him, Heinrich Heine uh, said similar things. Jabotinsky, declared that if the Jews will not finish with the diaspora, with the gal Galut, the Gola, the Galut, the Gola will finish with them. And a few days before the outbreak of World War II, Chaim Weizmann said that there would be, as a result of the coming conflict, six million Jewish victims, by which he meant 
Six million traumatized, terrorized, pogromized, dispossessed Jews looking for a haven for safety. So there were dark thoughts, lots of them, lots of them. Nobody predicted the massive industrial murder of millions of people in modern, or quasi-modern, industrial establishment set up for that purpose. Nobody predicted the Holocaust. But if nobody predicted the Holocaust, then the Jews of Germany were not rescued from the Holocaust. They were rescued from an anti-Semitic regime. Now, America had a moral responsibility as a, as a uh, government, a society devoted, uh, perhaps, hopefully, supposedly, uh, to humanitarian principles. Were the Jews the only ones in the 1930s that America was supposed to relate to? America protested against the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, where the Italians used gas to kill Ethiopians. There were the Japanese murder of huge numbers of Chinese people and the massacre of Nanjing in 1937 and the American society and American government certainly made certain noises that this was not okay, this was very bad. And the Japanese were engaged on something that was absolutely reprehensible. Was there any idea of having these people come to the United States? No. But of course, there was a large Jewish population in the United States. They were American citizens. Not only that, they were part of Roosevelt's coalition. Roosevelt's coalition consisted of Southern Democrats, many of whom were ultra-conservative, racist, anti-Semitic, and so on, and the uneasy coalition then with a liberal waspish northeast of the United States with the totally marginalized Afro-Americans, with Italians, with Irish, with the two major workers organizations the American Federation of Labor led by Samuel Gompers, a restrictionist and anti-immigrationist who opposed refugee immigration to America. And the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, which is much more radical, and they, they, they were the support of Roosevelt and the Jews. And they were by no means unimportant. Were they in Roosevelt's pocket? Well, after the elections, it turned out, yes. Before the elections, as was said here before, this was by no means certain. So yes, they were part of the coalition. So rescue not from the Holocaust. Rescue from an anti-Semitic regime. Now, there's a subtext that's attached to that subtext. Because the second argument, of course, which is implied, which is not always said very clearly, sometimes, yes, that the Holocaust was pre-planned. That Hitler envisaged it in 1919 or 1920 with his first appearances and so on. That it's contained in Mein Kampf. But you know, the uh, Mein Kampf, which is quite difficult to read because it's written in a horrible language, uh, has all the possible vilest accusations against the Jews. But it doesn't say what to do with them, except for saying that they cannot be equal German citizens. There was no plan that was developed by the Nazi party, 
before 1939 to do something, you know, beyond, of course, getting rid of the German Jews by immigration, by pressure for them, on them to, to emigrate and so on. My dear friends, it is my conviction that the Holocaust was prefigured in the Nazi ideology, but it was not pre-planned. The Nazis did not know that they were going to mass murder and try to annihilate the Jewish people. They didn't know that. On January 30, 1939, as was said here already, so I won't repeat it, Hitler made his famous speech in which he threatened the, annihil the, the uh, uh, annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe if the Jewish financiers in Europe and abroad together would, 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 would involve the war in another world war because they already had done it in World War I. And their aim would be to Bolshevize the world. Now, the Reichstag to which he, by the way, you can see this on film. So it was filmed, that speech. Uh, the Nazis in the Reichstag, of course, cheered. Tremendous, wonderful, terrific. But they were very surprised because nobody had prepared anything at all. There was no preparation. We know for certain today that there was no preparation. There was no preparation in 1940. The mass murder started with the German attack on the Soviet Union. What was there before that? There were three programs. One, when they started to enter Poland, when they attacked Poland, they had no plan for Polish Jewry, believe it or not. While the attack was going on on the 21st of September, on the day that the famous Schnellbrief of Heydrich was sent out uh, dealing with the Jews, that was a result of a discussion on that day in Berlin. And a, there are minutes of that discussion in the Nuremberg documents on the 27th of September, and there there is a direct intervention through Heidegger, of course, by Hitler. And the idea is to collect all the Jews in one place and push them over the new demarcation line with the Soviet Union into the Soviet Union. And in fact, not so long ago, a document was found in the Soviet archive which uh, related the fact that a high German official in Berlin approached the Soviet embassy there with a proposal to accept the Jews from the other side of the demarcation line in the Soviet Union. And the Soviets, of course, replied, no, thank you very much, no, thank you. So that didn't work. So another plan was put forward. We all know it, Madagascar. All the Jews in Europe under German control to Madagascar. Bad enough, terrible in fact. Not industrial murder. But that didn't work out either. So by the end of 1940, what shall we do with the Jews? In 1940, January 1941, Reinhard Heydrich in Prague makes a speech which is recorded, I mean, on paper, and in that speech, Heydrich says, we will deport all the Jews under our control in the coming victory over the Soviets. He's speaking to top police officials, and put them in the Arctic, the Soviet Arctic, under the guy, under, under the uh, control of uh, collaborators, Czechs and others and so on, and of course the supervision of the Germans. Again, pretty awful, and probably that would have resulted in the massive dying off of the Jewish population. But it wasn't industrial murder. It was not the Holocaust, it was not the final solution. Three programs, one after the other, 
So you may say, okay, but surely they must have planned something. Well, they didn't. Here is one document. Himmler on May 25, 1940, with a memorandum to Hitler. Now this is May 40, 25, right? The Germans are advancing through Belgium. That's three days before the Belgian capitulation. So you might think that Mr. Hitler had other worries at that moment, but no, he read that paper. And Himmler tries to convince the Führer what to do with the Poles and Ukrainians and so on and so forth under German control in the German-controlled part of Poland. And of course the Jews, part of the population. So uh, he wants to limit the, the Polish education, and in fact, eliminate uh, Polish education, turn the Poles into slave laborers, and uh, just use them uh, for the purposes of uh, German policies. What does he say about the Jews? I quote. I hope that the concept of Jews will be, uh, this is an exact translation from the awful German that these people were using, yeah? I hope that the concept of Jews will be completely extinguished through the possibility of large-scale immigration of the Jews to Africa or some other colony. And then he says, in the, in the, the immediate continuation, it must, also, it must also be possible in a somewhat longer period of time to let the national concept of Ukrainians, Gorals and Lemkos, Lemkis, uh, those are uh, Polish uh, ethnic groups, disappear in our territory. Whatever is said concerning these splinter peoples applies on a correspondingly, correspondingly larger scale to the Poles. We would today call it a plan for genocide. But then he carries on and says the following. Now listen carefully. Cruel and tragic as every individual case may be, humanitarian Himmler, right? This method is the mildest and best if out of inner conviction we reject the Bolshevist method of physical destruction of a people as un-Germanic and impossible. Now, there is a note by Hitler in Hitler's handwriting on the margin. This is Nuremberg documents. And it says, sehr richtig, very correct. Not next to that particular sentence, but the whole, the whole memorandum. So the man who will become responsible for the annihilation of the Jews of Europe, Heinrich Himmler, a year before that, is opposed to the physical destruction of a people as un-Germanic and impossible. No, there was no pre-planning of the Holocaust. You see, that's the second subtext. If you don't take into the account, then all the rest will become basically unintellig unintelligible. You, of course, you ask, well, why did they close the Jews in the ghettos? 1940, early 1941. There was mass death in the Warsaw Ghetto. There were terrible uh, uh, epidemics, typhoid. There were thousands upon thousands of young Jewish men who died in uh, forced labor camps on the border between the German and the Soviet uh, parts of Poland in order to prepare for the, for, for the invasion of Russia. So why? Well, we have the diary of Frank, Hans Frank. We know exactly. The idea was as Himmler says, to get them out, to deport them. Uh, the less, the better, sure. If some of, many of them die, okay, fine. 
no industrial destruction. And if the United States and the whatever administration had taken a stand of some kind, and you say, they knew, of course they knew. They knew about the ghettos. There were reports. There were journalists, not necessarily American, but neutral journalists, Swedish and others, who reported. There was one very famous uh, report by uh, a Jew who managed to escape to America, Shoshkis, uh, published. So everything was known, basically. I mean, not everything, but general idea, yes, things were known. Anyone who reads Hebrew and reads the uh, newspapers uh, in this country uh, during that time uh, will be able to read the detailed descriptions of uh, ghettos and so on. Sure, everything was known. So what should they have done? A neutral America in 1940, 41, uh, send a non-existent strategic air bomber force uh, supporting a non-existing American army in Europe from non-existent American bases in Britain at that point. Uh, when, the, uh, when Poland was out of reach uh, for the bombers at that point. So what should they have done? Ask Mr. Hitler, please stop persecuting the Jews? Everything was known. Now you see, there, there you have these thousands and tens of thousands who could have been saved. Because when David Wyman says in his book, Paper Walls, 1968, that America could not have uh, done much more than it did until 1939, because 1939, the quota was fulfilled and overfulfilled. And as we heard from Dr. Left this morning, I think, uh, there was a uh, uh, intervention by the Secretary of Labor, uh, Ms. Perkins, uh, with Roosevelt and the Cabinet and so on, and uh, these people, the temporary visas, were not deported although they stayed in America. So over full faith, quote, wonderful, terrific. Huh? And it was. And then in 1940 and 41, there's a change, a radical change, because the Americans then say, and Roosevelt is absolutely convinced of that, that there is a, a danger of Jewish spies on, on, on behalf of the Germans. And there you have the third subtext. It was mentioned here by my colleague and friend, Robert Wistrich, but only in passing. There is that gap between two wars that were fought at the same time in World War II. The War of the Allies, and that includes the Soviets, was a war against an imperialist Germany endangering the well-being and existence of Western civilization, of Soviet civilization. The Soviets actually started with an ideological premise. But the moment when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, it became the great fatherland war. In other words, a national war against a foreign invader. In the case of the Anglo-Americans, the danger of the way of life that was led in Anglo-America and elsewhere. This is a continuation of the wars since the Westphalian peace in 1648. These are national Interests. These are economic and military and other kinds of cultural interests and so on. You fight wars over that. 
That was World War I. Empires clashing. That was one war. The other war was waged by Nazi Germany. It was an ideological war. It aimed at a world conquest in the name of an ideology. And the ideology was something utterly and completely new. Because, uh, you know, there were changes over, you know, throughout history. One nation instead of another nation, one religion instead of another religion, one empire instead of another empire. But races, a racial hierarchy ruling the world with the Nordic peoples of the Aryan race, the center, of course, the Germans, on top and everybody else below them. And there are no races, my friends. As they say in London, and I am not English, I am Israeli, but I studied in Britain, so I know English expression. As far as races are concerned, there ain't no such thing. Because we all come 200,000 years ago from East Africa, whatever our color, our shape of body, and so on and so forth. Those are secondary and tertiary mutations. And if a inhabitant of Papua New Guinea marries a Harvard professor, they will produce healthy children. The difference between different types of dogs is much larger than between different types of humans. There are no races, we are one race. So, in the name of a non-existent something, a race, they want to control, they conquer, and kill, and eliminate all those who stand against. That's not an empire instead of another empire. That's something utterly and completely different. Yes, Bolshevism said something similar. Under Stalin, before World War II, yeah, sure. But not with the same kind of verve and the same kind of drive and the same kind of ideology, basically. I won't go into that. There is some similarity, no analogy, but some similarity between that and contemporary radical Islam. Uh, conquest of the world by force in the name of an ideology. And the Nazis wanted that. And there you have, that is the basis of the misunderstanding. That is the basis, I think, anti-Semitism or not anti-Semitism, of the misunderstanding of the leadership of the Western world regarding, regarding the Holocaust. They couldn't get it. They didn't get it not only during the war, they didn't get it after the war. And I suspect that many people in the West don't get it to this day. You have here something radical, very radical. Now there are other, holo there are other genocides. There's no difference between the suffering of the victims. Jews didn't suffer more or less than Tutsi or Khmer or anyone else. Uh, murder is murder, and torture is torture, and rape is rape, and killing of children is killing of children. But the radicalism of the Holocaust is not that. The radicalism is the concept of total annihilation of somebody that the perpetrators defined as being Jewish, not self-definition. They defined who was Jewish. So these are subtexts that I think one has to bear in mind. Let me pick out of many things and please stop me when two or three minutes before I have to finish, because uh, if you don't finish me, you'll be sitting here for the rest of the evening. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, when you 
talk about Roosevelt's policies in 1940-41, when he could have impacted on the State Department, despite Breckinridge Long, who had been before that the American ambassador to Italy and the great admirer of Mussolini and fascism. As he could have said, no. But he didn't, because he was convinced that the Germans would introduce Jewish spies. The idea that Germany would use Jewish spies is an idea that only somebody who didn't understand Nazism could have projected at all. And they could have saved thousands then, not from Germany anymore. It was slowly closing. There was the deportation of the several thousand West German Jews to southern France, uh, on the way to Madagascar, basically, huh? in 1914. And then slowly the doors began to close. It was no longer possible. But from France, yes. From France, you could have rescued people. Now, what did the American Jewish community, there is no such thing. What did American Jews do? Well, they did quite a lot, actually. An example, you see, then you translate macro history into micro history, because without micro history, you can't do the macro, and vice versa. Now, the JDC, the joint, yeah? was located in Lisbon after they were chased out of, fled from Paris with the German invasion. And uh, there were Jews crossing the border of the Pyrenees, together with French and so on. And some of them made their way, legally, illegally mostly, to Madrid, to Toledo. Most of them stayed in the north, in Barcelona, Later on, slightly, only very slightly later on, the Spaniards locked them up in a pretty awful internment camp, Miranda del Ebro. And so the JDC was looking for a way to, to help these Jews. And the Spanish dictatorship did not uh, agree to have any uh, Jewish social agency work in Catholic Spain, not only Jews, also Protestants. So the Quakers were out, the Unitarians were out. So what should they, so what should the JDC do? So they found, you won't believe this, Moshe Eisen. You've never heard of him. Moshe Eisen was a Polish Jew who by a fluke got permit, a permit to work as a doorman in a Madrid hotel in 1940. So the JDC got money to Moshe to distribute that money to Jewish refugees wandering the streets in Madrid, Toledo. Well, that wasn't terribly satisfactory, despite the tremendous efforts of Moshe. So they found a non-Jewish person, Mrs. Dorsey Stevens, the wife of the American military attaché in Madrid. Very nice person. And she volunteered, she heard of this business, she volunteered to take Moshe's place. She was a little bit better placed after all. So they got money to her and she distributed the money in central Spain. But most of the Jews were in the north. So JDC found a very shady Austrian character. I don't know whether he was Jewish or not. His name was Max Oberländer, and he probably pocketed quite a lot of the money. But anyway, he distributed money to Jewish refugees in the north. And then finally, the JDC persuaded the, Jewish, the secretary of the Jewish aid agency in Portugal there was a small Jewish community in Portugal, which was in excellent terms with the dictator, Antonio Salazar, because the head of the community was a, a, a school friend of Salazar's in Lisbon and so on, long story. And this secretary of the organization, 
his name was Samuel Sequeira, was sent by the Portuguese Red Cross. Now that was something to Barcelona. And from there, the JDC distributed, you know. Now, this is tremendous, actually. This is a Jewish organization trying to do what is really hard to believe that could be done in those circumstances. And they were helped by somebody they hated, namely the World Jewish Congress. Don't listen now, Lawrence. They hated them. And there was a Polish Jew with a Turkish passport, Isaac Weissmann. And he was a very adventurous fellow. He got in touch with a member of the Jewish underground in, in France, and they smuggled mainly children across the Pyrenees and got them into Portugal. Now, it's not exactly American Jewry. Weissmann was an American Jew. But his organization was based in America, the World Jewish Congress. So it is not as though the American Jews didn't do anything. They did within their possibilities. But the American government, that's the thousands or tens of thousands we were talking about before, didn't do a thing in that small area. Now. Let me go back. How much time do I have? Hmm? Uh, let me go back to Evian. After all, Roosevelt didn't have to do Evian, right? There was a refugee crisis. People who were not American citizens were persecuted in a non-American country in Europe. Uh, there was a Jewish community. Of course, they were, his, uh, they were part of his coalition. So should he do something, shouldn't he do something? The Congress was definitely radically, as Wyman shows, anti-immigration, restrictionist, largely anti-Semitic. Uh, he has to be careful. Don't touch the quota system, of course. But perhaps one can distribute the Jews. Where is uh, uh, Dr. Medoff? Yeah? Distribute the Jews all over the place. Uh, if, uh, lots of governments will come and so on. Now, there's a general agreement that Evian was a failure. I'm not quite sure, you know, because the result of Evian was not that somebody accepted Jewish refugees. They were not Jewish anyway, they were called refugees. Huh? But uh, the result was the establishment of the Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees, the IGCR. And that is considered to have been a flop. I don't think it was. Under nominal British chairmanship, it was an American effort to talk to the Germans for them to allow Jews to emigrate from Germany with money, because without money they wouldn't be accepted anywhere after many failures and many attempts, there was established in actual fact a contact with the German government. To cut a very long story very short, the Nazi economic wizard, Hjalmar Schacht, appears in London in January 1939. And he offers to emigrate 150,000 German Jews with German goods that they would buy for the journey, so they would have something to start with wherever they went. They would be established wherever by a large, huge fund that international jury would raise. And then they would ask their immediate relatives, another 150, perhaps more thousand German Jews, to join them wherever they were, in, the, in their new homes. All Jewish property would be confiscated in Germany, and out of the interest from that, those who remain in Germany, the old people basically, would be kept alive for the rest of their 
lives, and Germany would officially and publicly undertake not to touch them, to leave them alone and let them live out their lives in Germany under that protection. The Jewish leadership, economic leadership, uh, uh, the uh, Board of Deputies in Britain, in America it was the JDC, the American Jewish Committee, the Bnei Brit and others, were dead opposed to this. We are going to create an international jury that doesn't exist in order to help the Germans export uh, their goods uh, to other places. But Roosevelt insisted it was a chance. And the question arises, you see, did the Germans really intend this? Well, we now have documentation that proves that they did. On the 2nd of January 1939, Schacht met with Hitler, and Hitler said, yes, if you can, if you can do this, we'll go into it, we, we'll accept that, we'll do that. Does that not stand in contradiction to his statement the same month, later on, on the 30th of January, to annihilate the Jews if there was, you know, and so on? Is there not a contradiction there? I don't think so. If we can get rid of German Jews by advancing German exports, then why not? If we can't, we'll take other measures. On the 25th of January, one week before Hitler's speech, the German, the police basically uh, 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 Bureau of Jewish Emigration was set up under Reinhard Heydrich. And he was told, clearly in, in writing, that one of his tasks was to be in touch with the Schacht plan and so on. And if it comes to, if it, if it, if it works, uh, to help emigrate the Jews, you know, those 150,000 and the others and so on and so forth. If it doesn't, well, there are other means. There is no inherent contradiction there. You may say that they already planned the mass annihilation of Jews all over the world. No, not yet. It was prefigured in the ideology. But we have the first clear statement in a meeting that was already mentioned here. On the 28th of November 1941, between Haj Amin al husseini the head of the Palestinian National uh, Movement at that point, who was in Berlin collaborating with the Germans and so on, and Mr. Hitler. Now, Mr. Hitler didn't know any Arabic, very bad, and Mr. Husseini didn't know any German. So there was a translator stenographer, so we know exactly what was said. And it was already mentioned here. But I mentioned another sentence that Hitler said there. When we win the war, this is 28th of November. Chronology, you know, is very important in this business. On the 5th of December, it's one week later, the Soviet counteroffensive in, in front of Moscow starts. But this is a week before that. And Hitler says, not if we win the war, but when we win the war, we will turn to all the countries in the world to treat the Jews the way we are treating them here. And we are treating them here, this is after Barbarossa started in June 41, six months later. And by that time, and Hitler receives all the reports of the Einsatzgruppen, Roughly about one million Jews were murdered by the Anderskopf. So this is, he knows exactly what he means when he said the way we treat them here. It's then that you get the global intention for the genocide of the Jewish people. But as I say, I wouldn't say that Evian was a total failure. And the Jews were forced by Roosevelt to establish, while well, not international jury, 
but the coordinating foundation, it was called, which was supposed to raise these huge amounts of money to settle those 150,000 Jews somewhere. Now, there is no documentation to show where the Americans wanted to settle these people. But the quota was fulfilled in that year, you know? So if that continued, possibly, I have no way to prove that, I haven't found any documents, then, say, the quota was 27,730, German and Austria combined, then you say, well, within two or three years, you can settle quite a proportion of those 150,000 in America. Now, in May 39, the British issued their white paper on Palestine, 75,000 Jews in five years. So some Jews could settle in Palestine, and the rest would be distributed all over the, this may have been the thinking behind, may, I don't know. But Roosevelt insisted this is the possibility of rescuing these Jews from the anti-Semitic regime, because the anti-Semitic regime, for whatever reason, agrees to export them. And so he has a meeting with the Jewish leadership on May 4th, 1939, and he forces this down their throats against their will. You have to do this. You have to rescue these German Jews. And that's the only way I can do it. Now, Roosevelt is responsible for the non-issuance of American visas in France in 1940-41. So he's responsible for the bad things. If he's responsible for the bad things, he surely is responsible for the good things too. And the good things are the filling of the quota in that year, and this crazy idea that was proposed by Schacht and agreed to by Hitler. What do I make of that? To be very honest with you, I have no idea. It's terribly complicated. But then we, we'll, our lives are very complicated. And the Holocaust is awfully complicated. Now, there's another controversy uh, among us. What did the Americans know in the period between the invasion of the Soviet Union by the Germans on June 22, 1941, and the day that America was entered into the war by the Germans on the 11th of December. In that period of time, when I said, as I said, probably close to a million Jews were murdered. What did the West know about this? Rumors, rumors, and a couple of facts. For instance, the massacre at Kamenets Podolsky, where 16,000 out of 18,000 Hungarian Jews were murdered by, uh, by the Germans uh, with the help of Hungarians. There were Swedish journalists in Hungary. Uh, they got their material, uh, their information from Hungarian officials and so on, some of whom opposed this deportation to uh, the Ukraine, and it was published. So that was a fact. There was a rumor that in Berdichev, in the Ukraine, several hundred Jews were killed. The fact is, of course, that about 16,000 were killed. There was a rumor. Babi Yar, in September 41, in Kiev. There was information about it. There were reports about that, vague reports, not quite clear how many and so on and so forth, but it, 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 it came out probably through journalists in Moscow. I interviewed Herr Smola, the uh, 
uh, Boris Smola, the head of the JTA, <coughs> Jewish Telegraphic Agency, many years ago, it shows you how old I am. Uh, and uh, I interviewed Karski as well. But uh, when, when, when I asked him, he didn't know. And then Molotov, on the 7th of January 1942, has a press conference and he says that the Germans are murdering peaceful Soviet citizens all over the occupied Soviet territories. And he mentions Jews. He mentions Babiyar. He says 52,000 people were killed there. Well, the truth is that 33,000 Jews were killed there, but a very large number, probably 20,000 Ukrainians and other opponents of the German uh, occupation were killed there as well. So yes, it came out afterwards. Now, there is, of course, that book called Official Secrets by Richard Brightman, which says that between July 15 and September 15, 1941, the people who worked for the uh, MI6, uh, the Enigma program in Bletchley Park in England, <laughs> you know this very well, uh, uh, they, they, they managed to, uh, uh, to, to decrypt uh, uh, police reports from the occupied Soviet territories, German police reports. And there they reported they we, we killed so many opponents, partisans, bandits, and so Very often also Jews come in. And one British intelligence officer, officer wrote an analysis of this and said, it is clear that the Germans, in, in the occupied Soviet areas, nowhere else, the Germans were killing the Jews wherever they can. No, wherever they, <coughs> wherever they find them. That's the that's formulation. Now, these reports were sent not to the British Foreign Office, because MI6 didn't rely on the Foreign Office. They only sent them to the to military people, army, and air force, and of course, navy, but didn't, that was irrelevant. And the prime minister. So the prime minister in his typical Churchillian red pencil underlined these, these points in the decrypt. And he used it. And my colleague, Michael Cohen, who despite the argument over the pages of the Israel Foreign uh, 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 Journal, uh, is a very close friend of mine, as it happened. Uh, he put me right. I said he, he, Churchill made that speech in the parliament. No, he didn't. He read it over the BBC on that day, 24th of August. He didn't mention Jews, of course, because if he had done so, Germans would immediately have realized that the code had been broken. But he said, horrors are being committed, and so on. This was part of the approach of Britain to Stalin, August 1941. And uh, the Bletchley Park people, the Enigma people, were horrified. If the Germans really follow what is happening in Britain, they will realize that Churchill was using some decrypts well, they never, they never did, the Germans never did. But from that point on, MI6 refused to send its reports to Churchill. Now somebody, people, colleagues, have said, the West should have known from these decrypts what was happening in the occupied Soviet area. This is pure nonsense. First of all, it's only two months. And secondly, it was certainly not handed over to the Americans who were neutral. And the Americans at that point didn't have a secret service. I mean, they had an army intelligence corps. I mean, it was useless. <coughs> the uh, Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, 
the American spy agency uh, was set up in May 1942, much later. So the uh, Enigma people didn't inform. They, uh, uh, one of them said at one point, uh, the American, to hand it to, to, to the Americans, that I handing it over to a sieve. It's sort of very un insecure. So no. From that, the West should have de uh, deduced that the Germans were murdering uh, Jews in the Soviet Union. <coughs> and then, you see, as the Germans invaded, the planning began. It went along with the murder itself. And then it was very quick. Immediately after the invasion, already in the first weeks, some women and children were murdered as well, not only men. And then in the summer, it was clear that the Germans were going to kill every Jew they could find in the occupied Soviet territories. And in the early autumn, it was expanded to Poland the beginnings of setting up of Belgians in Poland is in October. The uh, Helno uh, thing is in September. The, uh, uh, and then the others follow. And then by the late fall, it's all of Europe. And as I showed you, by November, at least with Hitler's clear statement, it's all over the world. And that is unprecedented in human history. And that the Americans and the British and others didn't realize, didn't grasp. It, was, it is something people rejected. You know, in, at my age, I know that uh, people who are told that they have a terminal illness uh, very often reject the information. They know it's true, but they don't want to hear it. Some people sort of ridiculed my position, which says that there's a gap between information and knowledge. You don't have to be a PhD in philosophy to know that this is so. There's a gap. It takes different forms in different ways, with different individuals. But the fact that you have the information that you have a terminal illness doesn't mean to say that you know it. In other words, that you accept the knowledge, that you internalize the knowledge. <coughs> and sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't. Let me go to another issue that was uh, mentioned here and <coughs> five minutes two minutes that's too little five minutes I want to okay I have plenty to to talk about and uh, I have plenty of opportunities to do that so let me relate to the last paper that we have which is uh, in my view there's obviously, there was an emotional outburst here. In my view, it was an excellent paper. Because it was clearly professional military history, something that I studied uh, uh, a million of years ago when I was a young man. The question is when? It's clear that the Allied bombers, one way or the other, by the summer of 1944, could have bombed Auschwitz. It would have cost, it would have, it, it, it would have uh, uh, cost American lives, first of all, lives of inmates. And it's quite true, and I, I, have, I interviewed uh, probably uh, dozens, if not more, uh, survivors of Auschwitz, and it's perfectly true, they were yearning for bombardment of Auschwitz, whatever, whatever the price they personally would have paid for it. Of course, in the West they didn't know that. But with a report of first two, then the other two, escapees, Slovak as, as Jewish escapees from Auschwitz, 
Alfred Wetzler and Rudolf Verba, who escaped on May 7th and reached Slovakia on uh, April 7th and reached Slovakia on April 21. And then the second group, Czeslav Mordovich and Arno Shrozin, one exactly one month later, uh, the information came to the West. It's been mentioned here already. It reached Switzerland on 11th of June. It reached the, uh, the World Refugee Board on uh, June 28th. It would have taken a few days before any kind of attack on Auschwitz uh, would become feasible. <coughs> it would have been easy, of course, to make recon reconnaissance uh, 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 flights over Auschwitz to find out exactly where things were and so on and so forth. Uh, it wouldn't have rescued Hungarian Jewry because the deportations from Hungary ceased on July 7 and 9. So no Hungarian Jews would have been rescued by bombing Auschwitz. But after that, there were still deportations to Auschwitz. Auschwitz gas chambers were dismantled at the end of October 1944. And contrary to what people say and write, that there were 150,000 Jewish victims of gassing between July and November. This is simply not true. The number is uh, about half that, but that's still, still a very large number. So yes, in the summer of 1944, the date of August was mentioned here, I think correctly. They could have bombed Auschwitz. Would they have stopped the murder of the Jews? Absolutely not. And the proof is simply that when, they, when the Germans did stop the gassing at the end of October, from then on until the end of the war in Europe in May 1945, close to 400,000 Jews were murdered by the Germans and their allies. Not by gas. They didn't need to have gas. Of the 5.7 million victims of the Holocaust, 5.6, 5.7 million, over one half were not gassed. They were shot into pitches, ditches. They were starved to death. They were killed by epidemics that were introduced by the German treatment of the Jews. They didn't, they, they didn't need to have gas they would have shot them, as they did, between the end of October and May. So is the conclusion then that the Allies shouldn't have bombed Auschwitz? It's the exact opposite. Of course they should have bombed it. Of course. Not because they would have helped, but it would have made the statement that we care. It was a moral failure, not a military failure, not an economic, not a political failure. It was a moral failure. Some American politicians even, not all politicians are bad, you know, uh, recognized that, recognized that. They said, we should have done that. Because what the Americans and the British and the others were fighting for was a, wo a world in which these things would not happen. They do happen to this day. But that's the world they fought for. And the fact that they didn't bomb Auschwitz stood in contradiction to their own war aims. I have to stop here. Thank you.